Good morning. morning. Welcome. Ah, We are in the book of Matthew, so if you would grab your Bibles, pull them out, open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand and somebody will bring a Bible to you. Looks like everybody's good. So Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be picking up in chapter 5, starting in verse 17. We're still in the Sermon on a Mount. Uh, on, I said the Sermon on a Mount. That's close enough. The Sermon on the Mount. Um, and just a little disclaimer, we are going to be in the Sermon on the Mount until about 2021, I think. Maybe not. We've been in it for a few good weeks, and last week was Resurrection Day, always a good day. Uh, So we praise God for being able to celebrate He's alive. Amen? He is risen, and that's what this is all about, because these words that we are looking at and get to read this morning still speak to us in power and in truth because he's alive, because he sent the helper, and that's what we need, the word of God stirring in our hearts, in our lives with the power of the Holy Spirit. Sound good? Ah, that's what we need, amen. So Jesus is on the mountain, he's on the big hill teaching to his disciples, and anyone who would hear, we have a humongous crowd uh, as we start the Sermon on the Mount, and I kind of like this picture, it's kind of a little modern, but you can look at that if you want to, but it's the, the mountain, and then there's like a city up there. I mean, it's for us. It's for people. So uh, in our day and age, people need to hear this the exact same amount, you know, level-wise as they did back then. We need the words of Jesus. So he's on the mountain speaking to the people. It's really a big hill. The topic of the message is the kingdom of God. And the way that the kingdom comes is through you people, through us, Up to this point, we've only completed the first section of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes, and then the next couple little things, if you remember, which were really about living out loud, the next couple of sections. Um, And we would live our lives so that the world will hear our lives, will hear God through our lives, and that we would be a flavor as you are the salt of the earth, and that we would be a light as you are the true light that we would be those things, bringing the kingdom of God to the world. And that is a part of what the church is about. So this morning, we have the first change in direction, really, the second section as we start. And to me, it's not like a complete change in direction. It's kind of like a pause. And I don't know what would have happened that day on the hill. I don't know if he would have stopped and, and you know, some little conversations would have carried for a minute as they thought about it and then pick up again. I'm not exactly sure. But of the record we have, he comes in, not on a different topic, but kind of from, an, from another angle. Not to change the full direction. He's still speaking to and of the kingdom of God. But in this second section that we start in, and you might have already read the title to the section, it's he has come not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. So he comes in and shows us kind of like how the law is going to relate to the kingdom people and how we should view the law. Really good stuff uh, that we're going to get into. Um, He kind of shows us the, the law and then we're going to look at some of the way the modern religious culture of his day perceived the law or this handful of laws that we go through and then show us how God views the law. And really the flip side of that same coin, how God views the law is how we as his true kingdom, as his true children in the kingdom of his receive the law if we're going to be a part of that kingdom. So we got some... uh, Awesome teaching. Again, any time we get into the words of Jesus and we pick them apart, we, uh, I just say we, but I, I don't know. For me personally, I feel inadequate to touch the words of Jesus, to pick through them, to look through them. But thank God he's good, he's faithful, and I'm so grateful to have the word of Jesus. So let's just bow our hearts really briefly and ask the Lord, God, would you come and would you move in our hearts? Would you change us? God, we want genuine change in our lives. We want uh, a genuine walk. God, we we don't want to have uh, an appearance of godliness. We want you. 
And I ask that you would move in us this morning. Holy Spirit, be free to move in us. Be free to work in, in your word and just wash us with it. Lord, change us with it. Sometimes I think we need a slapping with it, an awakening with it. So would you have your way this morning as we look to you, the one true light. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So verse 17 and Jesus starts off and says, do, you, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. So Jesus starts this section out by making a point. And he says this, I would say he says this as the Messiah. He is the authority, and we're going to see some more into that authority. And as the Messiah is speaking, he says, I am not going to dismiss the law. I'm not coming with this new covenant to change the law. Of course, the law and the prophets was basically their Bible of that day, right? The law and the prophets was the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament. They called it the Word. But we know it as our Old Testament, and Jesus is teaching in this morning, in the way that he's talking, is different though than any other religious teacher of that day. And we're going to see a couple of examples of that shortly. He definitely taught with authority. And we, I think, look at his life and think, well, we would expect that. We know who he is. He's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. He's the word walking around. He should be speaking with authority. We know who he is. And I'm not sure if the people in this scene quite know who he is yet. I, I would say they probably are definitely leaning strongly in that direction. As the last couple of weeks ago when we saw what he was doing, he was healing thousands of people. Anyone who would come in this ministry, he would heal and authenticate the power that God had given him and who he was in those lives. And I'm sure there was a people that were made whole that were close to him on this hill, and that we're thinking, I'm going to hang on what he's saying. He's touched my life. He saved me, so to speak, and his words mean everything. May we have that heart, and may his authority have the same weightiness. May his words have that authority to us in our lives. Now, so he's got this authority. He's speaking. We know who he is. Jesus, a point quickly, Jesus could have said, I'm, I'm doing away with the Old Testament, I'm making the New Testament, but he makes this distinction which just kind of lines in the character of who God is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His law isn't changing and Jesus isn't saying no more law. Jesus is saying, no, I'm coming not to destroy, but to fulfill. And fulfill he does in a few different ways. The first one, as Jesus literally kept the law perfectly. He kept the whole law, not only outwardly, but also inwardly. And all that to say, Jesus kept the law perfectly in a way that was perfect and acceptable to the Father. And no matter how good we are on the outside, I would venture to say this. None of us can keep the law perfectly pleasing to God the Father. We can't. Even on my best day, I still have things going on up here. <laughs> in here that are like, well, that guy's a couple of bricks short of a load. You know, whatever's going on. I still have those. And you might think, man, Pastor Isaac's just so good. Well, you probably wouldn't. But if you did think that, <laughs> if you did think that, just speak to my wife after service. <laughs> but Jesus did this. He kept it perfectly. Now, as he does do it perfectly, does keep the law perfectly, he's going to offend some men, and he's going to do so in a way that are going to expose their false traditions, that they're not in keeping with the law the way that God intended. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. But his main reason for keeping the law perfectly is that he could become our substitutionary sacrificial lamb without what? Spot or blemish. His main reason in keeping the law is so that he could take our sins upon himself so that we could come in confession 
and we could be cleansed completely. I personally, I'm just saying this, I love confession. I mean, I don't know about Catholic confession, but I love confession to Jesus, my one true great high priest. Because I know when I get up from that confession, I've been cleansed fully. There's, I, I just want to skip. There's nothing like being right with God. I want to be like Josiah, my two-year-old, when he's having a good day and he just wants to run and he's like, Dad, watch. He said, he's kind of talking of himself like in third person now. He goes, watch Josiah. And then he runs. <laughs> and then he tries to skip and I just, it just fills my heart. The other, actually yesterday when I was working on some of the study, I was just kind of bumming. Anyways, all of a sudden I hear the door open to the bedroom and these little feet, and I look up and he's like full steam ahead and he just jumps on me and just, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God for him and you know what? May we run and jump in our Father's lap like that. Amen? So he keeps the law. Jesus keeps the law perfectly so that we can confess, so that we can stand up and be right as rain between me and my Father and how good it is. One part of him keeping the law perfectly that I just kind of want to bring to mind momentarily is that Jesus kept the law and there are some parts of the law now that are checked off as finished and completed because of what he did. And one of them is offerings and sacrifice. Right? You and I don't have to go get a lamb or a goat or an oxen and go make a sacrifice. Or when, when Josiah was born, we didn't go down and take two turtle doves and offer them to the Lord. All of the sacrifice, all of the offerings are completed in Jesus Christ. So that's just one of the ways that we can kind of categorize Jesus fulfilled the law for us and he completed some of it. So it's not done away with, it's fulfilled like he said he came to do. He also fulfills, it said, the law and the prophets. Of course, fulfilling the prophets of the Old Testament by fulfilling the prophecies. And in Matthew, we've already had those prophecies, all kinds of prophecies that are fulfilled in his birth, if you guys remember. And it'll say something like, and this was done so that the prophecy would be fulfilled, and it'll point right to it. So Jesus is fulfilling prophecy, and he's not done with that. There's still more prophecies to be fulfilled. So not one dot jot or tittle will disappear, meaning even the little punctuations, until all is fulfilled. And there will be a time, personally I can't wait, until all the prophecies in the law are completely fulfilled. It's going to be a good day. I'm just saying. But the law also still fulfills and is fulfilling a major purpose, and it's sprinkled all throughout the New Testament, especially in the writings of Paul. You know what it is. The law is there so we can see that we can't be perfect on our own. It shows us all as sinners and sinful, and that, and that we fall short of the righteous standard of God and opens our eyes to the fact that I can't be right with God on my own. I am in need of help. It's the best place to be because then we get the Savior and the power of his blood and the power of that cross. But we'll dive into some more of that here in just a moment. Let's look back to verse 19. So Jesus goes on and he says, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So now he really drives home a point here. And when I read this, I cannot help but think that he's speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Who, by the way, were considered to be the most righteous people in their day and age. And we'll get to some more on that in a second. But their traditions that were compiled over the years often missed the heart of the law. They would add these traditions that usually traded some outward act or some outward restraint for the literal meaning of the law. And they would keep those traditions with more fervor than they would the actual law of God. And the reason I think of them is because when they were training their apprentices, that's exactly what they would do. They would show them the law means this, Here's what we do, and this is what we're going to do. And they would train them, so to speak, to skirt the law in some areas. They would train them to live life in a way that would bring burdens to other people. 
And they would practice these so strictly and to the T. So really, here's what we have. It's Jesus addressing these religious rulers and teachers and teaching the common people, his followers, the heart of God towards the law. Then Jesus says, but whoever does them, the law, and teaches them shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. It's a couple of interesting things here. Jesus does tell his followers that they or we should keep the law. And I would say like this, we should walk according to the word. We should walk by this Bible that we have. And Jesus says, we should teach the word. We should teach the law. The most advanced or highest level of teaching or training someone in that day and age was to allow them to be the teacher, the rabbi's apprentice or disciple. So I'll kind of make a side note here in our thinking of teaching the law. I mean, sometimes you think automatically, well, you've got to be leading a Bible study. But the most advanced, highest level of training somebody in that day and age was to allow them to be your apprentice. I mean, they'd have schools, and the highest of those schools would go to, like, you know, an elite training. And then of the top of those class, the rabbis that were practicing would allow one of them or pick one or offer a, a job of the apprentice. And the idea of the apprentice was to really, you just live life and follow every footstep. Personally, I like that. Because in our lives, the best way to teach somebody to follow Jesus is say, let's go do it together. Come on, let's go live life together and let's try to practice the way of Jesus. Let's follow him. Yes, we need the Bible. Yes, we need Sunday morning and the fellowship and the communion. But we also need to just walk and be real with people. Have a few people in our lives. And think of my wife. My wife's been reaching out to a young lady who's been hanging out at our house. And she finds out how weird we are. But she also, <laughs> she also gets some guidance. She also gets some, let's come on, let's serve Jesus, let's do ministry together, let's just follow, let's be real. And that's what we need in our lives. So according to Jesus' words here this morning, if we show someone the path, if we teach, or if we train them to practice the way of Jesus, then you and I will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So I have to pause for a minute and look at that word. He's, he's saying, if we help someone to walk in truth before God and stay humble and daily come to the cross, we are great in the kingdom. One of the cool things that I like about Jesus, he's different than a lot of other religions. There's other religions that in order to get the full depth of the understanding of the greatness of it, you have to be in the secret club part. And all the common people, they don't get told the secrets of the... Jesus never does that. He tells everybody, do you want to be great in the kingdom of God? Here's how you do it. Only problem is, so many times what Jesus says isn't what you would naturally think or what you want. You think, well, yes, I want to be great in the kingdom of God, so I'm going to work up this ladder. And when I get to the top, I'm going to be the dictator. You people, what are you doing down there? Jesus is saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, here's the secret. You serve. You serve people. You teach them. You just walk in this life. You train them how to live. And we just follow Jesus together. I love it. But Jesus doesn't keep it secret. He tells all of us how to be great. It reminds me of the, the back when the uh, apostles were arguing over who was going to sit, where they were going to sit at the right hand of Jesus. Right? You guys remember that? And Jesus said, man, you guys, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you need to be as a servant of all. You need to be like one of these children. Personally, I'm thankful that he shares with us so that we can go forward in being true children of his kingdom. But then he goes on to say something that I, would, that I believe would have blown the minds of all the people in that day in verse 20. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And I would love to roll tape right there and see the faces. Like if I was standing behind Jesus' shoulder and watch the faces of all the people, or like, what? And the reason they would be going, are you kidding me? Is because of who the scribes and the Pharisees were. 
I mean, the scribes were people that were dedicated to studying the Word of God, and that's like all they would do. They would study the Word of God 24-7, all the time. If you're like, man, it's 2.30, I wonder what Bob's doing. If he's a scribe, you know what he's doing. You don't have to worry about it. He's down there, he's in the tabernacle, or he's at the, the place where they would meet, not slipping my mind, synagogue, and he's, he's studying the Word of God. The other one was the Pharisees. These were the religious rulers. We've been introduced to them already. They're kind of pious. They walk around. I always picture them in their gowns down to their ankles, just kind of floating along in their piety, looking down at people. But they were the extreme and of... I'm sorry, the extreme example of being dedicated to fulfilling or keeping the smallest details of the law. And an example was kind of like if they, were, if they got some herbs or something, they'd be out there in their little herb garden and they'd be counting one, two, three, ten, one for God. And they would always just kind of really be into the details. But the problem is, is they would make traditions that would be more burdensome to other people than beneficial. They would also make things in their lives that were easier for them so that they could kind of skirt the law. So we see some weird stuff in their lives. And a couple of examples. I don't know if you guys have, are familiar with the Pharisees at all, but usually whenever you start talking about the Sabbath, you go, oh yeah, I've heard some of those. Like you can't start your car. Because in starting your car in the morning, you are starting the internal combustion motor. You're kindling a fire. That's work. You can't do that. You know, the, all the different things that they, little, you know, details that they would put, and they're really not the heart of the law. They're causing more burdens on other people. One of them was prosthetics, right? You can't wear your prosthetic leg on the Sabbath because you're carrying a burden. Your false teeth, same way. Your glass eyeball, you got to take it out on the Sabbath. <laughs> Otherwise, you're carrying a burden. But... They would do stuff like Friday. They had this little amendment kind of thing in their law, like Friday. Well, the law was you can't only go so far from your house or it's too much of a walk and it's a burden and it's work. So they would set up these booths on Friday. Every, you know, they count the feet off every so often from their house if they had to go somewhere on the Sabbath. And they would go and they'd walk into the booth and say, well, this is a nice extension of my home. Look at this place. It's my new home. And they walk to the next one. And they go down. And so you could see their heart in that. Jesus said something about these guys. It just popped in my head as I was thinking about this study. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 24, he says, Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. But one of the commentaries I went through said it was commonly thought in that day that if only two people could enter into heaven, it would be a scribe and a Pharisee. So in the minds of these people, they were near perfect. And so to them, Jesus just said, you have to be perfect to enter into the kingdom. <laughs> we know that's true. But it only comes through Jesus, right? So they're thinking this is impossible, and that's what they needed to think. It is impossible apart from the blood. So now Jesus goes on, and he begins to teach this handful of laws. And he's going to go through this pattern where he's going to go, he's going to do this pattern the rest of the chapter. First, he's going to cite the law, the common law. Then he's going to correct the teaching of the law, or the teaching of common day, with uh, the, the true meaning of the law, which begins with the heart. And then he's going to kind of teach on that topic. He's going to give us some good examples, some challenges, some big heart checks on the topic. But overall, I mean, he's going to speak to us about what really matters to God, and that is that God does not care only about the outward like man does, that man sees, but God cares about the inner man, the heart, the imaginations, the thoughts. Did you know we could sin against God in our mind and no one knows it? Well, we know it. God is going to hit the heart, the core of humans. And I love it. It's what we need. Thank you, Jesus. And in doing this, he carries the same theme throughout. That the attitudes that we carry in this life are important to God. And they're important to us in our endeavor to honor God. 
They affect our walk with God. They affect our relationships with people. And if we're supposed to be salt and light, then our attitudes and our relationships to other people matter to God. How we relate to people, how we communicate with people, our attitudes toward people. So let's kick it off here. The title to the next section in my Bible says, Murder Begins in the Heart. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So here's this first off, this pattern, this structure that Jesus uses that I was referring to. He goes and he's going to use this the rest of this chapter. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, So this is the law, then he goes on pronouncing that law. Then he says, but I say to you, but I say, here's what the law says, here's what the law said to those of old, but I say to you. When Jesus says, I say, he's really just saying, let me speak into the matter of this law. He's saying, let me correct your thinking according to the kingdom of God and not according to the tradition of man. Uh, and I, let me just say, this would have been such a different thing for people to hear him saying, but I say to you in regards to what God says, that's huge. First of all, when the prophets of old were speaking, you know what they would say? They would say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. Jesus says, this is what I say. Right? I mean, I'm thinking, is it just me or is there a little hint of Jesus' authority as the walking, talking word, really, right? And secondly, when the rabbis would teach in that day and age, they would never say something like this. They would usually quote another rabbi. The rabbi Hallel says this on the topic. They would never use themselves as the authority for their teaching. And here we have a rabbi doing it strongly for the first time. People are, I think, going, whoa, whoa. Either this guy is crazy or he's God or he is the Messiah or he is who he says he is. Just a thought. May we count the word of Jesus as that weighty in our lives, as that authoritative in our lives, as the final say, amen? So now let's look at what Jesus says. He says, you have heard it said, you, thou shalt not murder, you shall not murder, which was a, a, it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? It was common. Every good Jewish kid knew that law. It was, a, it was a common thing. You can't murder. Now there was a teaching in that day and age that said you can't murder, but you don't have to like people, right? You might not like what that guy just did. You can't kill him, but you don't have to like him either. You can hate him in your heart. And that's not breaking the law. So we see men taking the thought and carrying it to a place where it's not what God would have for us. So Jesus is really dealing with this thought, this modern thought in that culture, which really is dealing only with the outward keeping of the law, but not the inward. And Jesus says, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whew, man. Man. I had a thought when I read that. It says without cause, and I thought, you know what? Almost every time that I've been angry with somebody, really, when I get down to it, it's foolishness. I'm mad at somebody for a reason that isn't truly some reason that I should hold on to. It's not worth being angry over them for. It's without cause. That we would examine our own lives and the reasons that we're frustrated towards somebody. But a note here. Jesus is not taking away from the law and he's not adding to the law. And he's also, this was an interesting one, he's not saying that the two are equal, especially from a social law standpoint, like the laws of the land. In the laws of the land, you cannot murder somebody and that's good, but you can still hate somebody as long as you don't hurt them, as long as you don't kill them. And so that might be where this rabbinical traditional thought kind of comes from, right? But Jesus is going to correct that. Now, as we look at this, physical murder is obviously 
worse than hating somebody. To kill somebody, to take a life is huge. Spilling of blood, God talks about. He sees it. That blood cries out to him. But what Jesus is saying is that to only keep the outward command of the physical or the physical of the law of not murdering somebody is not where the law stops. It goes past that to our heart. Now, for the most part, uh, prayerfully, that's not something that you guys here this morning are struggling with, the outward keeping of not murdering. You're going, man, i got to really cut back on murdering people. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, and that's kind of the point of this, most people aren't murderers. There are some. But most people get irritated with people. Most people get angry towards people. And that's the heart. If you and I really want to have the kingdom mindset to be children of God's kingdom, it needs to go past the outward action, and it needs to go to the action of not murdering in the heart. So remember from a few weeks back, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think I would go as far as to say that us having an impure heart of hating our brother would keep us from seeing God. The pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart. The heart of the matter is the attitude that you and I carry toward those who we are angry with, toward those who have offended us in some way. And then moving on, verse 22. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. I think we're all busted on this one. <clears throat> raka. Now, it was said in that culture, the word Raka had to do with the tone of contempt that you would use towards somebody. But, it, but the actual word was really the same as calling somebody worthless, a worthless person. With, with a little tone involved there. And Jesus said you'd be in danger of the council, which would be in danger of being judged. And then he says, calling someone, you fool, which would be like, I, don't, I feel like in modern, our modern vernacular, like, oh, idiot, right? Oh, you fool. You'd be, wor you'd be in danger of the judgment. So here we have someone not breaking the law of murder, but still showing outward contempt towards a brother. And Jesus is being clear. It's not the law on murder that matters to God as much as the attitude of the heart. It's both. The attitude of the heart towards people. God cares about our attitude towards someone else. You know, and I don't... I, pro, I, I think about him seeing our heart and like... Maybe you don't say, you idiot, out loud, but maybe in traffic you think, this person. There's so many times I think about this, and it does cut me to the heart, because there's so many times that I look at somebody and go, you ding-dong, you know, what are you doing? Are you kidding me right now? Have you heard of a blinker? What, whatever it is, you know. Like, why are they stopping right here? Oh, there's, there's some elk over there, of course. Here we go. Everybody stop. Get your phone out. But that we would have an attitude of grace and love, of mercy towards people that have wronged us. Let's move on. Verse 23. Therefore, he says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Yikes. So Jesus turns around, and he kind of turns around the whole idea that we've been rolling on here for a minute, and says... If you're going to worship to make an offering, which of course would be, you know, like coming here this morning, if you're going to go worship, if you're going to go get with the Lord and be right with him, and you remember on your way, not that you're upset with some idiot, 
but that someone may be upset with you. Someone may have been offended by something you've done. Stop what you're doing, leave your sacrifice, and go make it right. That's pretty big. That's pretty hefty that Jesus is telling us, first get right with man. He's not in any way saying that worshiping God isn't important. What he is saying is that our heart is right before God, before we worship, is important. He's communicating that broken fellowship with our brothers or sisters can, does, and will hinder our fellowship with God. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. I wanted to read this New Testament passage that really lines up rather well with what we're talking about here today about being right with the Lord about being right with men first, our brothers first. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 5. So 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, and it says, This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And here's where I want to focus in. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, and you would almost think it would say, God, with him. But what does it say there? We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And the Lord is speaking to us through this verse, through John, Jesus is saying, if you're walking in the light, if you're really walking in truth before God, then you will have fellowship with one another. It's important to God to have fellowship with one another. And then I want you to notice the order. It's the same as in our text. The first thing listed is that we would have fellowship with one another and then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, will cleanse us from all sin. Then the offering, then the worship. If we're being real with God, we're going to have the desire to be right with our brothers, to be right with fellow men, mankind, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Now, in closing, we're going to be wrapping it up here, but can I just say we're not quite done with this topic. But if we've been, as we've been talking about this topic, there has been a person or maybe a couple of persons come to mind that either you have offended or are upset at, or maybe you've offended and they're angry towards you. I would just say this. We should do what we can to make it right and make it right as soon as possible. According to verse 25. To quickly make it right. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Make it right. And it's interesting that at the end of this section, he likens it to being thrown into prison. Can I just say, allowing unforgiveness or bitterness in our heart is not hurting the person that you're angry toward. It's putting us into prison. It will keep you in a place of bitterness. Spurgeon told a story of when he was a younger pastor and kind of first taking over that church that he was so famous for pastoring. And there was an older gentleman who any time he was around would speak of all the problems that he had with the previous pastor. And, and according to Spurgeon, he said, it had been a few years back that this pastor was there. So Spurgeon encouraged him to just forgive the man and get right with the Lord and move on in life. Man, don't stew in this. Get right with the Lord. And the man said, sir, time does not change facts. To which Spurgeon said, but it should change the Christian. The point is, we should be growing in our walk with the Lord. We should be growing in forgiveness. 
We should be moving closer to Jesus and not letting the past keep us in a place of broken fellowship. Of walking in a place not right with the Lord because of the heart. And can I just say, throughout life, the heart is a huge problem. It's deceitfully wicked. It's able to fool even us. We need to guard our heart. We need to be open with Jesus and real with Jesus, coming to the cross often. And this is something that we must do as believers. I want to ask Caleb and the music ministers to come up. Something that we must do as believers is we must choose to forgive. Even when we don't feel like it. Trust me, there are going to be days you don't feel like doing biblical things. Let me just say, doing biblical things is the right choice. It's the right move. And then after that, once we've forgiven, then we're going to have to forgive again and forgive again. And when those old feeling of, feelings of anger and bitterness and hurt rise up, because they will, then we forgive again. We take our hurt, our pain, our bitterness, we take them to the cross. A few years ago, a few years, a few days back in my devotional, I was reading. The devotion said, uh, it was, a, it was that, that section of scripture that talked about, if you have begun in faith, how foolish are you to continue on this walk in the, in the strength of your own flesh, in your own strength? And the thought of the devotion was saying, look, if you have sin, if you have unforgiveness, if you have bitterness, don't keep walking on in your own strength trying to suppress those things. Do what you did when you first came to Christ and take them with you to the cross. Take that sin, take that frustration to the cross and walk in the power of God, in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the cross. And let me just tell you, the gospel, the cross, the sacrificed Lamb of God is where all the power is. As he went to this cross and forgave those who persecuted him, his very words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And aren't we so quick? to rise up. A few days ago in my prayer life, it was a few weeks ago actually, I, I, I think I might have mentioned this before, but I was praying and I was trying to, I was kind of sounding like David. I'm like, hey, God, go attack my enemies. Kill them, you know. And, and, and the Lord showed me, because, and I, I said out loud, I said, God, I'm just a worm. And he said, no, you're not a worm. You're a snake. Because when you get stepped on, you bite. Jesus was a worm and not a man. And when he got stepped on, he prayed, Father, forgive them. We need to come to the Lord in prayer. We need to come to the Lord real and allow him at the cross to cleanse us. But first, let's get right with our brothers, amen? But first, let's do what he said. Let's practice the way. And we should sincerely pray over our, our offender because prayer changes things. Prayer will change, will change them. But better still, prayer will change us and our heart. So as we just uh, surrender, let's all stand. As we just surrender this morning, if there's anyone here who wants to come and pray, if there's anyone here who wants to confess, if there's anyone here who wants to let that old unforgiveness and bitterness go, let's do it this morning, amen? Let's get right with Jesus. Holy fire burn away my desire for anything that is not of you and it is of me, I want more of you and let.
less of me Thank you. I, I pray, Lord, that we would have done it. During that time of worship, we would have come to you and just confessed our heart, confessed our attitudes toward you, God, and, and just come to you in the reality that we are poor in spirit. God, in and, in and of ourselves, there is no good thing, Lord, it's just you. So, God, continue to work in the healing in this church and this fellowship, God, as we practice your way. As we follow your way, we don't want to just come and hear a good sermon. We want to follow Jesus in truth. So keep working in us. God, may we be the light. May we be the salt. May we be the evidence, the reality of the true kingdom of God, that it is real and it is now. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.